In the modern world, social media is important when someone is reported missing. Social media has the power to make a missing person poster go viral, reaching millions. This allows for greater public awareness and is more likely to generate tips. Sometimes these tips can make or break a case, giving closure and justice to the victim's families. Number 5 30-year-old Joanne Risch didn't have the best start in life. Born as Joanne Bard in Brooklyn, New York, she lost her parents at age 9 in a house fire. Thankfully, Joanne's aunt and uncle took her in and provided her with a stable upbringing. By the 1950s, Joanne was well on her way to becoming the career woman that she had dreamed of. In just a few short years, Joanne's life would change for the better before taking a mysterious and bizarre turn. In 1952, Joanne walked across the stage at Wilson College in Pennsylvania and collected her English literature degree. This was the start of something big for Joanne. She set her sights high and landed a secretarial role at a publishing house. Eventually, Joanne's skills shone through and she worked her way up to editorial assistant. She moved companies in the mid-1950s to Thomas Y. Crowell Co. and it would be here that she would meet her future husband, Martin Risch. It was a whirlwind romance between the pair and a few short years later, in 1956, Joanne Bard became Joanne Risch. She agreed to leave her dreams of becoming a publisher behind in order to become a housewife and homemaker. Martin had a stable job with a good income and the pair settled in a comfortable house in Connecticut before moving again to Lincoln, Massachusetts. By 1961, Joanne and Martin had welcomed a daughter, Lillian, and a son, David, into the world. Joanne seamlessly slipped into her new life as a homemaker, but some believe her cheery demeanor was merely a mask. October 24, 1961 marks the day that the rich children's lives would change forever. That morning, Martin left Brighton early for an out-of-town business trip. He kissed his children goodbye while they were still asleep before saying goodbye to his wife. Hours later, Joanne woke the children and went about their usual routine. Joanne took her daughter Lillian to a dental appointment and cashed a check while David was in the care of a neighbor, Barbara. Barbara said Joanne seemed to be in good spirits that morning and there was no indication of what was to come. After the appointment, Joanne let Lillian play outside with Barbara's son while she tended to David. At around 1.55 p.m., Lillian rushed to Barbara's house with David swaddled in her arms. She placed David with Lillian and Barbara's son without saying a word to Barbara. Lillian later told officers that her mother told her she would be back soon. This would be the last time the Risch children ever saw their mother. Barbara took note of Joanne's erratic behavior and told investigators that she saw Joanne at around 2.15 p.m. standing next to her car, looking dazed and carrying something red. Hours later, at around 4 p.m., Lillian ran back home in search of her mother, only to be confronted with red smears on the wall. Little Lillian rushed back to Barbara's house, crying for her mother. When Barbara arrived at the Rish home, she couldn't believe her eyes. Red smears had covered the kitchen walls and the landline phone had been ripped from its hooks and thrown into the trash. It was clear there had been a struggle, so where was Joanne? Barbara called for the Lincoln Police Department and one of the most bizarre missing person investigations in Boston's history would begin. Officers found the phone in the bin with a single red thumbprint. Joanne's book of numbers had been left on the emergency services page and chairs in the kitchen had been overturned. Barbara and other neighbors were questioned extensively, but nobody recalled hearing anything that afternoon. The red smears in the kitchen were found to be type O, the same as Joanne's. Martin Risch became the primary suspect, but he had a solid alibi as he was in New York on October 24th. Joanne's disappearance rocked the community and a bizarre tip came in days after her disappearance. One neighbor told the Lincoln Police Department that they'd seen a dirty blue and gray 1954 or 1955 sedan, possibly General Motors, parked outside the Risch home that afternoon. Efforts were made to track this vehicle down, but this quickly went nowhere. Investigators began to dig into Joanne's private life and quickly learned that she was not as happy as she seemed on the surface. Joanne had left her dreams of becoming a publisher behind to raise two children, which had taken its toll on her. While Joanne loved her children, facing this loss was challenging. 
Investigators also uncovered another bizarre clue. In the summer before Joanne's disappearance, she had checked out over 25 library books, but these weren't any old books. These books detailed unsolved and mysterious disappearances with details on how to disappear. While this topic may not be so controversial today, in the 1960s it was considered dark and macabre. Joanne was an avid reader, having obtained her degree in English literature, and Martin Risch said it wasn't uncommon for Joanne to spend her free time reading. The final clue in Joanne's case was called in by several witnesses along Route 128. They described seeing a disheveled female walking along the road, looking dazed and confused. Her legs were covered in red liquid and she was holding something to her stomach. The investigation into Joanne's disappearance spanned several months, but no substantial leads were uncovered. In modern times, internet sleuths have postulated that Joanne faked her own disappearance as detailed in the books she was reading. Those close to Joanne knew she was unhappy with her new role as a housewife and believed she may have used the books as inspiration for her own disappearance. No solid evidence supports these claims and it remains a mere theory. The only solid evidence in Joanne's case is the red smears in the kitchen. According to reports, somebody attempted to clean them up using a rag or dish towel. This lends itself to the theory that Joanne was taken against her will but how did the neighbors not hear the disturbance if this was the case? Until Joanne is found, the mystery surrounding her disappearance will prevail. Anyone with information is asked to contact the Massachusetts State Police at 781-897-6600, quoting case number 612623. Number 4 21-year-old Leisha Riley was beginning to find her place in the world. Leisha had attended Mount Mercy Academy before attending Buffalo State College. Her parents were exceptionally proud of her achievements, and it was clear that their daughter would go far. To help support herself, Leisha got a job in a restaurant, and everyone who worked with her sang her praises. Leisha was known to be a kind and considerate young woman devoted to her studies. But one chilly January evening would change the trajectory of Leisha's life forever, leaving her family devastated. On January 31, 1985, Leisha received a call from her close friend asking her if she wanted to go out to the Pierced Arrow Bar that evening. The Pierced Arrow, located in West Seneca, was a star-studded location in the mid-80s. The infamous NFL team, the Buffalo Bills, were known to patronize the bar and many in the area knew it as the center of the single seat. Each weekend, young people would pack themselves into the bar, hoping to get lucky or meet the love of their life. Leisha accepted the invitation and dressed in a black jumpsuit with a black jacket, complete with red trim. Leisha kept the red theme, opting for a red handbag and red shoes. That evening, Leisha braved the cold and left her parents' house, headed for the pierced arrow. Leisha's friend decided that she wasn't in the party spirit after all, and shortly after arriving at the bar, the girls parted ways. Leisha was supposed to catch a ride with this friend, but she assured her that she would find someone else to take her home when she was ready. This minor decision would change the events of the entire evening. Leisha began dancing, and it was then that she met 28-year-old Daniel D. Rose, an off-duty New York State trooper. At around 3 a.m., Leisha was seen leaving the pierced arrow in the company of Daniel Rose. What happened to Leisha after this remains a mystery. 55 minutes later, Daniel's friends saw him come back into the bar, but this time he was alone. According to reports, he headed straight for the bathroom and emerged several minutes later. As the sun rose on February 1st, 1985, Leisha's parents awoke with a sickly feeling in their stomachs. Leisha's bed had not been slept in, and this was the first time in her life that she had never come home. Not wanting to waste a single moment, Leisha's parents called the West Seneca Police Department and reported their daughter missing. Leisha's friend, who she was with the night before, was questioned at length and this is when the mystery began to unravel. Leisha's friend confirmed that she had left early that evening, with Leisha saying that she would catch a ride with someone else. Patrons of the Pierced Arrow were also questioned and all signs pointed to Daniel Rose. During his interview, Daniel admitted to seeing Leisha for the first time that evening, but insisted that the two did not leave the club together. In Daniel's words, he left the bar at 3 a.m. with a blonde woman named Kathy. The two went outside of the parking lot for about 20 minutes before Daniel returned to the bar. Daniel Rose's version of events stuck out amongst the statements. 
Every witness they interviewed was certain that Daniel left the club with Leisha that evening. So where was she? Hours after Daniel was questioned, he obtained a lawyer and refused to cooperate with the investigation further. Disturbingly, investigators discovered that Daniel phoned in sick on the morning of Leisha's disappearance. Daniel's lawyer declined to let his client talk to the authorities, but there was one person left to speak to, Paul Schwartzmeier. According to Schwartzmeier, he and Daniel left the pierced arrow at around 4 a.m., heading for Daniel's apartment. Shortly after arriving, Daniel left saying he was going to visit a female friend. The next morning at around 10 a.m., Daniel returned telling Schwartzmeier the friend he had gone to see wasn't at home. So whose version of events is accurate? Investigators believe Leisha did leave the pierced arrow with Daniel Rose, but so far there's been no physical evidence uncovered to bring about a conviction. Two weeks after Leisha's disappearance, Daniel's employment with the New York State Troopers was terminated. The New York State Police stated his termination was not connected to Leisha's disappearance, but have refused to comment on the matter further. The physical search for Leisha too yielded no results. Miles upon miles of forest and woods have been combed with the aid of helicopters and cadaver dogs, but there was nothing to be found. Leisha's family fought to keep her name in the media in the hopes that somebody out there knew something. Rumors and speculation flew around West Seneca, with many residents pointing the finger at Daniel Rose. Despite being questioned multiple times, Daniel kept his lawyer close and refused to answer any questions. Eventually, the search for Leisha was called off and her family was left devastated. Friends and family of Leisha would continue their own inquiries, combing miles of wasteland in their free time, but nothing was uncovered. A year would pass without Leisha, and on January 31st, 1986, friends, family, and the public gathered to remember her. A month later, in February of 86, the West Seneca Police Department received another bizarre tip. This time, the tipster claimed they could find Leisha's body in the Chaffee landfill. According to the Niagara Falls reporter, the landfill had been struck by a brutal storm at the time of the search, making conditions all the more difficult. The tip claimed that Leisha had been disposed of in a dumpster. Experts and volunteers spent weeks sifting through the waste, but no sign of Leisha was ever found. In 1998, Daniel found himself on the other side of the law when he was arrested for driving under the influence. Daniel had caused a car crash due to his erratic driving and even threatened and kicked an officer at the scene. Daniel, who's now 66, has never publicly commented on Leisha's disappearance. After Leisha's disappearance, several women would come forward to complain about Daniel's behavior. These women claimed Daniel had been forceful and coercive after they'd rejected his advances. Patrick Riley, Leisha's father, believes Leisha refused his advances that evening, sending him into a tailspin. In 2016, Patrick Riley, Leisha's father, passed away. He was Leisha's biggest advocate and the driving force behind discovering what happened to her. On the 18th anniversary of Leisha's disappearance in 2003, Patrick gave an interview describing the impact of his daughter's disappearance on his life. He commented that it had robbed him of joy and happiness for the rest of his days. Leisha's mother is still alive and the family's offering a $10,000 reward for information that leads to Leisha or the person responsible for her disappearance. Anyone with information is asked to contact the West Seneca Police Department at 716-6744-2280, quoting case number 850079 or 85145LI. Number 3. 26-year-old Jean Spangler was known as a kind and caring woman devoted to her daughter, Christine. Aside from being a mother, Jean had ambitions of being a star in Hollywood. In the 1940s, Hollywood was reaching its peak and people worldwide watched patiently for the latest film and accompanying starlet. It was no secret that those in Hollywood were fabulously wealthy and had everything they could have ever dreamed of. But Hollywood has a dark, seedy underbelly, one that chews people up and spits them out, leaving them broken. Born in Seattle, Washington, 1923, Jean Spangler displayed star power from the moment she entered the world. As a teenager, Jean attended high school in Los Angeles and performed at the Earl Carroll Theater. Jean hoped this experience and education would be what she needed to land a job in Hollywood. It wasn't just acting she was interested in, but singing and dancing. 
Jean was a vivacious and bright young woman who was often labeled as a party girl. In 1942, Jean met and wed Dexter Benner and the relationship was anything but happy. Six months after the pair said I do, Jean arrived at the courthouse to file for divorce. She told the clerk that her husband was cruel towards her. It took almost four years for the divorce to be finalized and in the meantime, Jean continued seeing her soon-to-be estranged husband, Dexter. During this on-and-off relationship, they gave birth to their daughter, Christine. Between 1946 and 1948, Jean was denied custody or visitation of her daughter by Dexter, who had filed for sole custody. Jean appeared at the courthouse begging to have her daughter back and finally she won. Dexter was furious with this new ruling, citing Jean's love of drinking and partying. During the final proceedings, Dexter hissed, I'll fix it so you'll never get to see her again. Disturbingly, just a year later, Dexter's wishes would come true. Jean had broken through into Hollywood, at least somewhat. She was known as a bit actress, someone who had a few minor lines to help encompass the overarching storyline. By 1949, Jean had starred in When My Baby Smiles At Me, Chicken Every Sunday, and Young Man With a Whore. Jean worked hard every day on set to get herself noticed, hoping this would be her push to a starting role. She always had her daughter Christine in mind, which made the events of October 7, 1949 all the more bizarre. After divorcing Dexter, Jean and Christine moved in with Jean's mother, brother and sister-in-law in Wilshire, Los Angeles. At around 5 p.m., Jean left home asking her sister-in-law Sophie to take care of Christine while she met with Dexter. Jean explained that the two were meeting to discuss a late child support payment. Sophie explained Jean seemed both anxious and angry about the meeting. After meeting with Dexter, Jean would be on set for eight hours before she would arrive home in the early morning hours. Jean kissed Christine on the head, grabbed her handbag and walked out of the door for the last time. Jean Spangler never returned home. Two days later, her sister-in-law Sophie reported her missing to the Los Angeles Police Department. At first, the LAPD were uninterested in Jean's case. They told her family she'd likely gone off on her own and would be back soon. Her family didn't subscribe to this belief and began canvassing the streets. A vital clue was uncovered after the report was filed and the LAPD had brushed off the family. A worker in Griffith Park found Jean's handbag in Ferndale, a valley littered with greenery. According to the LA Times, Ferndale was the idyllic spot for a family picnic but it was also the location of many bodies that serial killers had dumped. One of the handbag straps was torn, and inside, detectives found an interesting note, and it read, Kirk, can't wait any longer. Going to see Dr. Scott. It'll work best this way while Mother is away. The main question on the LAPD's mind was who were Kirk and Dr. Scott? Sources cannot agree on precisely what happened next. Some say investigators found Kirk Douglas through Jean's private life and career while others say Kirk Douglas called the LAPD after hearing of Jean's disappearance. According to reports, Kirk Douglas is the only Kirk that Jean knew. The pair met briefly on the set of the film Young Man with a Horn. Kirk confirmed that Jean was only an extra and the two barely knew each other. As it would turn out, in 1945, Jean and Scott, an army lieutenant, had an affair. The affair was short-lived, but when Jean tried to break it off, Scott assaulted her and threatened to take her life. Luckily, Jean was able to escape and never saw Scott again. Shortly after discovering Scott, the LAPD learned of a mysterious man named Doc who paraded along the Sunset Strip in Griffith Park, offering procedures to women. Investigators were never able to track this mysterious man down, and this lead fizzled out. Robert Cummings, an actor who had worked with Jean at Columbia Studios just weeks before she disappeared, told the LAPD Jean had confided in him about a new romance she was having. Robert said the romance was not serious, but Jean seemed extraordinarily happy. Days after this, another lead came in, placing Jean at the local farmer's market at 6 p.m. the night she disappeared. The market was a few meters from Jean's home, and the staff on duty said it looked as though Jean was waiting for someone. The LAPD had their hands full with Jean's case. There were so many loose ends that often led nowhere. The final lead investigators received would turn the case on its head. The last and perhaps most puzzling tip places Jean with little Davy Ogle, 
and Frank Nicolay, two mobsters who worked for infamous crime boss Mickey Cohen. According to the LA Times, Jean was meeting with the mobsters in Palm Springs just a few days before she disappeared. By late 1949, both men were under indictment. Mysteriously, both men disappeared shortly after Jean did. Their bodies were eventually found later, and the connection, if any, to Jean Spangler remains a mystery. Some speculate that Jean perhaps ran away with the mob because of her faltering acting career. Others believe she may have run away with a lover or was taken by force. A myriad of theories exist in Jean's case, ranging from sensible to shocking. Until her body is found or new witnesses come to light, it's unlikely we'll ever discover what happened to 26-year-old Jean Elizabeth Spangler. Number 2 26-year-old Jane Ellen Wakefield was a woman who saw her job as more than a 9 to 5. Jane worked as a school teacher at Penn Elementary School in North Liberty, Iowa, and she paid great attention and care to her students. She planned lessons meticulously and always thought of new ways to keep her students engaged. After graduating high school, Jane took the path of education, and her bright, cheery personality made her the perfect fit. In the early 1970s, Jane officially became a teacher, marking the start of what would be a long, illustrious career. Instead, Jane's life would take a very different turn in September of 1975. Late on the evening of September 6, 1975, residents at the Bon Air Mobile Home Lodge in Iowa City, Iowa, heard loud screams and shouts. The sound was coming from the direction of Jane Wakefield's home, but the residents couldn't be sure. Since September 6th was a Saturday, residents assumed the noise was coming from a house party in a nearby mobile home park and chose to go back to bed and ignore the screams. The sun rose on September 7th, 1975, and the Bon Air residents were blissfully unaware of what had just happened right under their noses. Sometime that morning, a friend of Jane's went to her mobile home for a quick visit. The friend knocked on the door, stood back and waited for Jane to open the door, but the home was eerily silent. The friend knocked again and again, but there was no answer. Her friend left the mobile home, assuming Jane was not there. Jane had spent September 6th on a cross-country bike ride with friends. The trip saw them outside for most of the day, but Jane told the group she needed to leave early to get back for an appointment. Six months before her disappearance, Jane Wakefield had filed for divorce from her husband, John. The two met in 1966 at Sioux City Public Museum and were wed the following year. Unfortunately, the relationship broke down and after filing for divorce, Jane moved into the mobile home park. Shortly after moving into the park, Jane began a new romance. The two were taking things steady and waiting for Jane's divorce to be finalized. Jane had become frustrated with the process as it had hit major hurdles several times. Her estranged husband, John, and her could not agree on how they would split the two businesses they co-owned. Jane's cheery demeanor shone through despite the hassle and was well-liked. When Monday, September 8th came around, friends and family of Jane were starting to become extremely worried. The last time anyone heard from her was Saturday morning and now she'd failed to show up for work at Penn Elementary School. The school's principal, Larry Sharp, called the Bon Air Management Office asking them to check up on her. The manager of the park called Jane's boyfriend and the pair headed to her mobile home. According to Iowa cold cases, the park's manager and Jane's boyfriend found her beloved pedal bike locked out front and her car parked in its designated spot. Inside, the trailer was in order, everything was in place, including her wallet and handbag. The Iowa City Police Department later commented it appeared that Jane was taking a shower when she disappeared, leaving all of her personal belongings behind. The pair ran for the nearest phone and called 911. Unfortunately, the initial investigation was lackluster. At first, investigators were adamant that Jane had left to join a cult called Jesus People. A branch of the cult had been camping near Coralville Lake, close to Jane's cabin. Investigators spoke to the cult, who confirmed Jane was not with them. Investigators finally dropped the lead and began pursuing more logical ideas. In January of 1976, investigators got a massive break in the case when an anonymous informant came forward with a shocking clue. According to this informant, he overheard Mr. X, whose name has not been released, confessing to the crime. 
He walked through all the details, telling the informant that he had burned Jane's body and scattered it in a ditch on I-80 near Iowa City. The informant also told investigators that Mr. X, the man who confessed to the crime, had deliberately misled the investigation to try and make it look like Jane's new boyfriend was responsible. The perpetrator even went as far as renting the same car her boyfriend drove to throw investigators off of his trail. The informant told investigators that on the night of September 6, 1975, Mr. X drove from Cedar Rapids Airport to Jane's Bon Air Mobile Home Lodge. He exited the car, walked into Jane's home and asphyxiated her. He then put her body in his trunk and drove it to the building where Jane's estranged husband, John Wakefield, lived before disposing of her along I-80. Days after investigators received this tip, they obtained a search warrant for the apartment, trash incinerator, and business of John Wakefield, Jane's estranged husband. According to the Gazette, Iowa City Police found bone fragments and a piece of metal in the incinerator. These samples were sent to the state crime lab for testing, but the results were inconclusive and could not be linked to Jane. Since 1975, Jane has been declared deceased in absence. Her remaining family would like to find her remains to give her the burial she deserves. Her estranged husband, John Wakefield, maintains his innocence and has never been charged in her disappearance. Several suspects have taken lie detector tests, but no arrests have ever been made. Anyone with information is asked to contact Detective David Gonzalez of the Iowa City Police Department at 319-356-5451, quoting case number J1675. Number 1. In the summer of 2017, 19-year-old Karina Slusser received what she believed to be the offer of a lifetime. A man she had just met promised her more money than she could count and a life of luxury. This was a stark contrast to the life she was currently living, living paycheck to paycheck and trying to make money stretch. Karina's teenage years had been difficult and she struggled to find her way in the world. This brand new offer was just what Karina needed, or so she thought. The chance encounters with her new friend would lead Karina's life down a dark path. Karina grew up under the care of her mother, Sabina, in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania. She dropped out during her final years, despite her mother pushing her academically. She tried several times to obtain her education certificates through other means, such as online classes, but Karina struggled to dedicate herself to the program. At 18 years old, Karina had begun to slip into a deep depression. Her friends were graduating from high school and she felt left out. Sabina, Karina's mother, continued to support her and push her daughter, even when their relationship was frayed. Karina dreamed of becoming a makeup artist, and from her social media images, it's easy to see that she was naturally gifted. In April of 2017, Karina moved into a friend's house in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. At first, the move was good for Karina, but things quickly deteriorated. Karina worked as a waitress, but this wasn't enough to support herself. According to her roommate, Karina began accompanying wealthy men to meals and other affairs to earn money on the side. The arrangement between the two friends didn't work out and Karina was kicked out of the home in Hazleton for refusing to pay the rent or bills. Around this time, Karina began chatting with 32-year-old Giovanni Pagero online. After being kicked out of her friend's house, Karina planned to move back in with her mother, but unfortunately that never happened. Shortly after being kicked out, Karina went to New York to meet with Giovanni with just her phone and ID in hand. Giovanni promised Karina the world. He vowed to get her a place to stay in New York, telling her he would buy her clothes and whatever she wanted. When Karina arrived in New York in the summer of 2017, the reality of the situation hit her. The money Giovanni provided her came with a price. According to reports, Giovanni made Karina work on the streets to earn money, and every penny she earned would be turned over to him. On August 25, 2017, the New York Police Department responded to a disturbing call from Harlem Vista Hotel at around 1 a.m. The call had been made by Karina, who claimed Giovanni had attacked her and stolen $300. When the NYPD arrived at the scene, 19-year-old Karina was clearly shaken and upset. According to the Charlie Project, a temporary order of protection was issued against him following this incident. Sabina was informed of the incident and pleaded with her daughter to come home. In September of 2017, Karina's grandfather passed away and she received the news and was devastated. 
Sabina made arrangements for Karina to fly to Florida for the funeral, but just days before the flight, Karina dropped the bombshell. She told her mother her social security card and driving license had been stolen, so she couldn't fly. In retrospect, this confirmed to Sabina that Giovanni and Ishii were likely involved in something highly illegal. On social media, Karina portrayed herself as living a perfect life. She posted images, most likely stock images of an apartment, with the caption, My first apartment all to myself in NYC. Never been happier in my life. Forever dream accomplished. Investigators are still unsure if Karina was the one to make these posts. The last contact Karina's family had with her was on or around September 20th, 2017. She was due to have arrived in Pennsylvania on September 19th but never made it. Witnesses recalled seeing Karina at the Haven Motel on Woodhaven Boulevard and 68th Avenue in Queens, New York, where she worked for another man, Ishiwoni. During this time, investigators uncovered messages between Karina and Giovanni. Karina's messages appeared desperate and frantic. In one text, she said, quote, Please let me come. If not, I could be locked up tonight. I think this guy just did some bad stuff. He left me in a short stay that's up soon with no money and no food. Giovanni promised Karina that things wouldn't be like last time, a typical tactic of dangerous relationships. Unfortunately, all messages and social media posts stopped around September 20th to 24th, and Karina Slusser has never been seen or heard from again. Sabina filed a missing person report in October after failing to hear from her daughter. Sabina had spent many months trying to get her daughter home and knew that a lack of contact was a bad sign. The Montour Township Police Department in Pennsylvania opened the case and collaborated with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Investigators quickly focused their sights on Giovanni and Ishii, who were among the last people to see her alive. The pair and their associates were interviewed at length, but the NYPD failed to uncover any evidence linking them to Karina's disappearance. Karina's story went viral through social media, and hundreds of tips and possible sightings flooded in. In April of 2018, Sabina received a disturbing message from someone claiming to have Karina hostage. They demanded $7,500 in exchange for Karina, with the designated meeting place being a Greensboro, North Carolina hospital. Sabina refused to send the possible captors money, to which they responded, Remember this day though, April 17th, 2018, because it's the day you almost got her. Investigators have been unable to confirm whether this message was linked to Karina's disappearance, although there is a high likelihood it was just a sick prank. Since Karina's disappearance, Sabina has been the driving force behind the search for her only daughter. Sabina maintains social media accounts to help spread the word and bring her daughter home. While there's not enough evidence to convict Yobani Pigero and Ishiwoni in Karina's disappearance, the pair have picked up several federal charges between themselves. In early 2018, the FBI became involved in Karina's case and obtained a DNA sample from Sabina for future comparisons. They also uncovered new information about Karina's phone, which last pinged in Jamaica, Queens, in late September of 2017. When asked about Karina's disappearance, Giovanni told investigators he believes she is alive and well living in New York City. Both men have denied any involvement in Karina's disappearance and no evidence has been uncovered on the contrary. In 2019, ABC7NY reported that Sabina purchased a phone and linked it to Karina's phone number. According to Sabina, after connecting the number, she could access Karina's photographs, apps, calendars, and emails, but not her calls or texts. Bizarrely, two years later, in November of 2021, Karina's social media accounts showed new activity. The activity in question was a Facebook search for Sabina's name. Sabina told the FBI and NYPD that she does not use Karina's social media accounts. So who had access to it and why? There is a glimmer of hope that Karina is still out there somewhere, waiting to come home. Karina Slusser is described as a white female with blonde hair, blue eyes, 5 foot 7 and 140 pounds. Anyone with information is asked to contact Detective Walter Harkins of the New York Police Department at 212-384-1000, quoting case number 2017-520056. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. 
Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.